You're listening to the Dune Steef Audio Fiction Magazine. And now, here's your hosts, Rish Outfield and Big Anklevich. Bonjour, mon frère. Welcome to the Dune Steef Audio Fiction Magazine. Volume 1, number 4, page 4. I am one of your hosts, Rish Outfield. And I am Big Anklevich. And that is 08OT. We welcome you to the show. Thank you. Not T- you, the listener. Okay. Well, Sorry, you, go on. Uh, I'm flustered now. It doesn't I, take much, does it? Normally, I would say that today's episode is A Better Teleportation Theory by Michael Anthony, but... Okay. That'll do, pig. Michael Anthony lives in Santa Rosa, California, and works in the healthcare field. He writes in his spare time, and his stories have appeared in Desolate Places, from Hadley Ryle Books, Dark Distortions from Scotopia Press, and in podcast format on Pseudopod. He has more stories to be published this year in Arkham Tales and Afterburn Sci-Fi. Today's music is Johann Sebastian Bach's Partita in C Minor by On Classical. Today's narrator is Abby Hilton. There are links to both in the show notes. A Better Teleportation Theory by Michael Anthony Stanford University seemed to bustle with more activity than usual. Students strode across the yellowed grass and down halls with backpacks flung over shoulders, hurrying in and out of the classrooms. A giant banner hung over the wide doors of Braun Lecture Hall, welcoming Professor Tasha Meckler back from her sabbatical. Tasha smiled and strode inside. Her students stood clapping. Some of them cheered. Someone in the back yelled, You gonna leave us now, Professor? Tasha smiled, nodding, not to answer the question, but to acknowledge the energy of the room. Sorry to disappoint those of you not looking forward to the final, but I won't be leaving. I enjoy teaching you rascals too much. I'd retire and buy a Ferrari, someone yelled. What, and give up my Porsche? Laughter. (laughs) I'd like to remind you that we've only been successful with Adams, she said. It could be decades before we have Star Trek-style teleporters. Can I be Captain Kirk? Someone asked. Tasha grinned. Picard is a better choice. More laughter. (laughs) Okay, okay, she said, nodding and holding up her hands. I may have been gone for a week, but molecular physics doesn't take a vacation. She stood at the chalkboard, picking up a pointer. Open your books to Chapter 7. We have some catching up to do. After class, a boy strolled up to her and held out a magazine. Would you sign this for me, Professor? She blinked at him, then realized that she'd need to get used to that request. She glanced at the picture on the cover, now all too familiar. Her, smiling into the cameras, as she stood on the White House lawn next to the Vice President. She made a mental note to have a copy framed for posterity. That evening, Tasha sat in her office grading papers. The phone rang and she let the answering machine pick it up. It had been ringing all afternoon and she was tired of talking to reporters. A rap on the door. It swung open and Carl Sartre, her partner in the Ezekiel Project, paced in. There you are. Don't you answer your messages anymore? I've been busy. That team in Sweden tried to verify our results, he said, chewing his lip. They found an error. Our people are double-checking their conclusions now, but... What are you talking about? It looks like we screwed up. Tasha lowered her eyes. That's impossible. I warned you it was too soon to go public. Tasha stared at him. You saw it work. We teleported hydrogen atoms. Carl groaned. An illusion. We all wanted it to work so much, and our judgment was affected. Check your messages. The Swedes have detailed the error. But I'm on the cover of time. They're already working on a follow-up story. They're going to make us look like quacks. We'll probably lose our jobs. Be lucky if we're not sued for fraud. Tasha heaved her elbows onto the desk and covered her eyes. We were so close. We were going to change the world. 
If we just had a little more time. Our credibility is gone. And soon our funding too. I'm sorry, Tasha. It's over. A decade later, Tasha drove a Toyota with a dent in the hood into the parking lot of John F. Kennedy High. Teenagers sat on crabgrass, staring at her as she stumbled out of the car. One of them whispered something, and the others laughed. A kid wheeled by on a skateboard, cutting in front of her. Tasha stopped mid-stride and flapped out her arms to keep balance, her attaché case jingling in her hand. Sorry, Mrs. Mackler. That's okay. Be careful on that thing. She trudged to her classroom. Students sat in their seats, doodling. A few stood in back, giggling and whispering. A fat kid crouched near the window, flipping off someone outside. Tasha cleared her throat. Some of the students glanced up, droopy-eyed. You, in the back. Take your seats, please. The students meandered towards their desks, continuing their conversation. Okay, Tasha said, smiling. We're discussing mitochondria today. The students groaned. Now this is important, said Tasha, looking over the class. Science is the foundation of all our civilization. Anyone here watch Star Trek? Science is what will make that possible one day. Take, for instance, teleportation. Not that bullshit again, someone in the back mumbled. Laughter. (laughs) Fine, said Tasha, clenching her jaw. Read Chapter 7, Quiz on Friday. The room filled with the noise of backpacks being opened. Books slammed onto desks and shuffled through. Tasha flipped through a popular science magazine, pretending to read. After school, Tasha walked out to her car. As she fumbled in her purse for her keys, she noticed a blue envelope tucked under the windshield wiper. The week before, she had found a Xeroxed invitation to a garage band's debut at the community center. She tossed the envelope on the passenger seat and drove home. Their neighborhood, once an upper-middle-class area that Byron, her husband, had been so proud of, now sported aging homes with unkempt lawns that flanked cracked sidewalks. Tasha pulled into the driveway. Remembering the letter, she grabbed it and paced over to the garbage can. As she lifted the lid, she noticed a pie symbol embossed onto the back of the letter. She ripped it open and read, Dear Dr. Meckler, you are cordially invited to witness an event without precedent in the field of teleportation. You are one of a handful chosen to take part in this demonstration tomorrow at 4 p.m. Directions on the back. And because of security issues, strict confidentiality is appreciated. We look forward to seeing you. Dr. Andrew Baker, President, ABT Group. Tasha balled it up and tossed it in the trash, one of her students playing a trick on her. It could be worse. At least they didn't leave tacks on her chair. She shuffled into the house. Byron sat on the couch, watching his soaps, just like every other day. She loved him, but she wished he'd get a job, for his sanity as well as her own. A bucket of Kentucky Fried Chicken sat squeezed between his thighs, and he was sucking the meat off a bone as she walked in. The kids are great, but they can be a handful, said Tasha, setting her case on the table. How was your day? He grunted, rotating his jaw around a mouthful of chicken. Once a supportive husband with big dreams, his attitude had soured in the ten years since she lost her job at Stanford. The stock she still held, and the dividends they paid, she suspected, were one of the few reasons he stuck around. A commercial came on, and Byron smirked, his lips smeared with grease. Dr. Rockwell cheated on his wife again. That guy gets more ass than Hugh Hefner. Tasha kicked off her shoes. Her feet screamed in pleasure. Is that Beverly Hills Hospital? I never got into soap operas. He snorted. If they had one starring Stephen Hawking, you'd watch it. She nodded sheepishly. You want some chicken? Thanks, but I'm not hungry. I think I'll go up to my study tonight and work on my project. Oh? He said, elevating an eyebrow. You haven't worked on that teleportation theory of yours in a while. Thought you gave up on it. I just haven't been motivated. But something happened today that got me thinking about it again. Well, knock yourself out, he said, licking grease off his fingers. Make us a billion dollars. 
Tasha trudged upstairs, climbing over piles of dirty laundry and empty soda cans. The sound of the television echoed through the dark and musty house. Tasha rolled around under the covers that night, her mind trying to work a puzzle it couldn't solve. Byron lay sprawled next to her, his upper lip quivered as he snored. The letterhead on the invitation, she realized, was high-grade bond, and the embossed emblem was too sophisticated for a high school prank. The garbage truck was coming in the morning, and she slipped into a robe and slippers and shuffled outside. The crumpled letter lay on top of a pizza box. She unfolded it and carried it up to her study. The paper felt soft, like pressed cotton, and she ran her fingers over it as she reread the cryptic message. Could they really have made a breakthrough? And if so, why contact her? Did they need her help? Stacks of papers, almost two decades of work, lay strewn across her study. Books, folders, notebooks, scraps of napkin with inspired doodles done between dinner and coffee at Denny's lay everywhere. She spent the rest of the morning sorting through it all, triaging the most important items and setting them aside. If it were true, if they had made some sort of discovery, maybe they could use her research. Maybe they needed her help. She stuck her tongue between her teeth, gently biting down as she organized her papers. Tasha floated through classes the next day, glancing up at the clock every few minutes. The bell rang at 3 p.m., and she hustled out to her car, bumping into a couple of students in the parking lot. She followed the directions on the letter and drove out of the city and into a business park on the outskirts. Warehouses and office buildings, many looking deserted, lined both sides of the street. She parked in front of an aluminum-sided building. A sign that read, ABT Group for a Better Tomorrow, dangled in the window. She hurried inside. Plastic ferns and cheap-looking chairs sat in the corners of the small office. A print of a sailing vessel hung on the wall. They didn't seem well-funded, she thought. But before she had gotten the grants, much of the Ezekiel project had been done out of her basement. A secretary sat behind the desk, typing, and she glanced up as Tasha entered. Can I help you? Tasha's hand shook as she held out the wrinkled letter. I found this on my car. The secretary read it, nodding. Please have a seat. Someone will be with you shortly. Tasha lowered herself into one of the chairs and waited. Fifteen minutes later, a man wearing a suit that Tasha thought looked worth more than she made in a year strolled in. He was tall with strong shoulders and dark eyes. Cute. His face stretched into a smile when he saw her. It looked genuine. Sorry about the cloak and dagger, he said, holding out his hand. I'm Dr. Baker, but call me Andrew. Tasha shook his hand. What do you hold your degree in? Physics. I'm a professor at Harvard, he said. I'm so glad to finally meet you, Dr. Meckler. You're a legend in the field. Tasha forced a smile. I'm afraid I haven't published anything on the subject in four or five years. It was a tragedy what happened to your work. Cut short. The fools needed a scapegoat and they lost a genius. You are very kind. I'm afraid I deserved the blame, however. We have something to show you, Andrew continued, taking her arm and grinning like a child on Christmas morning. He led her into a warehouse next to the office. Wood pallets leaned against the walls. A light coat of sawdust covered the concrete floor. In the middle, a man in a lab coat knelt in front of two glass encasements that looked like modified aquariums set on their ends. They were connected by a green hose that, Tasha thought, looked like it came out of someone's garden. A young woman in lab whites sat at a desk with a computer the size of a cafe espresso machine. She typed something, and the one kneeling held up a thumb and nodded. These are my associates, Drs. Franks and Patel. Andrew said. The woman glanced up and smiled. The man kneeling at the pod yelled, Nice to meet you! over his shoulder. With something of this magnitude, mere words can fail us, said Andrew, gesturing to the pods. So we've set up a demonstration. Tasha clasped her hands. What is all this? Watch, said Andrew, grinning. 
A box of baseballs sat on a crate next to the desk. Andrew pulled one out, unsheathed a pen from his jacket pocket, and signed his name. Yep, it's a baseball, she said. Congratulations. Andrew smirked and tossed it to the man at the pod. Show her. He opened a glass door, placing the ball on a platform in the center. The woman typed something into the computer. Here we go, said Andrew. Both pods filled with a white smoky gas and vibrated. After a few seconds, the shaking stopped. Andrew strolled over to the first pod and opened the door. The smoke dissipated, exposing an empty platform. He opened the door to the second pod. A baseball sat in the center. He picked it up and tossed it to Tasha. Her eyes widened. The ball was cold, like it had spent an hour in the freezer. She rotated it in her fingers. Andrew's signature was between the red seams exactly where she saw him write it. Sweet Christ, she whispered. What have you done? At this point, it's just a neat trick, said Andrew. We've run into problems. Problems? You've just solved the oil crisis. Hold on, said Andrew, holding up his hands. That ball is about the extent of the size of what we can teleport. We've run into a roadblock. We were hoping you could help. It looks like you've done just fine on your own. What do you think I can do for you? We want to bring you in on the team. With your knowledge and background, and a little financial backing, we figure we can crack this wide open in less than a year. Financial backing? Why not go to the government or a corporation? I bet any number of companies would kowtow to write you a blank check. Because... Andrew continued. We don't want this invention corrupted by corporate greed. And if we went to the government, they would likely try to pervert it into some kind of weapon. If you notice our humble surroundings, he said, gesturing around, we're not doing this just for the money, but to help mankind. This could solve many of the world's problems. Tasha nodded. She understood that motivation. In fact, it was what she had told the Time magazine reporter a decade before. So why me? I've been out of the loop for years. It's on the shoulders of your work that we stand. If it weren't for the breakthroughs you made at Stanford, none of this would be possible. Which breakthroughs? We modified your quantum entanglement theory. We were successful with converting subatomic particles to waves and teleporting them across the lab. This has been done, of course, but then we did it with the entire atom. Tasha grinned. I knew it was just a matter of time before someone made that work, she said her chin bobbing up and down. But how did you get around the laws of quantum mechanics for anything larger? We didn't get around the laws. We just bent them a little. We're all made up of subatomic particles. If one can be teleported, why not a group of them? Andrew picked up another ball and held it up. If you get a large enough group, you have a baseball. Tasha cocked her head. Yes, but how did you do it? I'm sorry, said Andrew, winking. But to tell you that, you'll need to come in as a partner. Tasha studied her shoes. After a moment, she glanced up. How much do you need? I'm not rich. I lost most of my money when the Ezekiel project went bankrupt. We need about two million to move this into the next phase. In a year or so, when we make this public, your stake will be worth many times that. Two million? Tasha shook her head. If I sold everything I have, I might be able to get seven or eight hundred thousand. Andrew glanced sideways at the man at the pod and then back to Tasha. Well, get what you can. I'm sure we can come up with the rest. It's your expertise that we really need. Let me think about it. I have to talk it over with my husband. I understand. Andrew put his hand on her elbow, walking her to the door. And if you can't do it, no worries. We have a team in Sweden chomping at the bit to get in on this. You were our first choice, of course. Tasha nodded, chewing into her lip. She'd be damned if she let the Swedes show her up again. She drove home as if on autopilot, her mind on things she hadn't thought about in years. Byron lay on the couch, his leg draped over the side, and a pint of ice cream screwed into his fist. She relayed the story, trying to contain her excitement. If she seemed too enthusiastic, she knew he would be even more against it. Are you messing with me? He said after she was done, not taking his eyes off the television. 
It's an extraordinary opportunity for us. We can get in on the ground floor. He scoffed. Ice cream coated his teeth. You're a gullible fool, Tasha. Teleportation is impossible. The Swedes proved that, remember? This is different. I saw it work. They just need a little more capital. I'd need to sell our stocks. You aren't selling anything, he said, cutting his eyes at her. I'm not going to let you flush our savings down the toilet on another pie-in-the-sky wet dream. This could revolutionize the world. That's what you said at Stanford, remember? It revolutionized you out of a very good job. If you sell our stocks, we won't have enough to live on. Not on your salary. You could get a job. Bust my ass at Cheapy Mart for minimum wage? Because you played roulette with our nest egg? He put down his ice cream and sat up, hunching forward. Listen to me carefully, Tasha. I stuck with you through humiliation after humiliation. Most guys would have packed their bags after their wife ended up being the punchline of late-night talk show jokes. But I stuck around. But if you repay my loyalty by squandering our savings, we'll have a problem. These people need my help. If what you say is true, I'm sure they'll do just fine without our money. But... I'm sorry, Tasha. It's for your own good. This conversation is over. She bit her cheek. Fine. She thought about Byron's comments at school the next day. Maybe he was right. They couldn't afford to make risky investments. But what if the ABT group really did need her help? There were the Swedes, but when it came to teleportation theory, she could run circles around the best of them. Her involvement could mean the difference between making it work soon or years of more research. The world was choking on greenhouse gases and needed such a breakthrough now, not in a decade. She phoned her broker at lunch break and sold all their stocks. Byron would be upset, but once the company went public, she knew he'd get over it. He would be rich, and she would be vindicated. After school, she went to the bank, cashed all their savings, got a loan with the house as collateral, and had it all consolidated into a single crisp cashier's check. Liquidating the bulk of one's assets was easier than she had thought. She put the check in an envelope and carefully tucked it into her purse. A lot of hope rested in that piece of paper. She met Andrew at the ABT office and gave him the money. Glad you decided to come in on this, Andrew said, grinning. I'll have our lawyer get a contract out to you. You're going to be filthy rich. That's not why I'm doing this. Andrew's smile lost some of its luster. Yes, of course. Tasha held up her attaché case. I brought some things I've been working on over the past few years. Maybe it can be of help. Thank you, Andrew said, taking it and handing it to the secretary. She looked at him inquisitively and then placed it on the floor behind the desk. Can I look at your research? Tasha asked. See where we're at. Yes, but give us a few days. I need to catch a plane in an hour. I'm going back to Harvard for a seminar. And Dr. Patel is visiting a sick relative. Mind if I take a look at the teleporters? I'd love to. You can examine them with a microscope if you want to. Andrew said, chuckling. But not today, I'm afraid. Dr. Patel wrote the software that runs them, and she doesn't like the computer messed with unless she's here to supervise. But I'm good with those th- Patience, Tasha, Andrew said, taking her elbow and leading her to the door. It'll all be here in a few days for you to pour over until your eyes cross. He walked her to the car. And don't look so glum. You're a partner now. Tasha twitched awake that night, her face scrunched into a soggy pillow. She dreamed she was at the ABT warehouse, standing at the teleporter, about to give a presentation to a group of onlookers. She put a baseball in, typed in the code on the computer, and pressed enter. Nothing happened. She beat her finger down on the key. The baseball sat unmoving in the pod, as if taunting her. Reporters made a semicircle around her, pointing, laughing. Byron stood at their vanguard, shaking his head. You're a gullible fool, he said. She kicked off the covers, wiping sweat beads from her forehead. Byron lay on his side, back to her, his steady snoring filling the room like a leaf blower. She curled into a fetal position, staring into the dark, thinking. 
worrying. At 8 a.m., she called Harvard's general information line. After three transfers, she reached a secretary in the physics department. Do you have a Dr. Andrew Baker on staff? Yes, we do. He just walked in. A pause. This is Dr. Baker. How can I help you? English accent. Higher pitch. Tasha swallowed. Are you the only Andrew Baker at Harvard? As far as I know. At least in the physics department. Why? Do you know anything about the ABT group, the teleportation project? Teleportation? Is this a joke? Tasha hung up. The knot in her stomach grew into a coiled rope. She sped to the warehouse, screeching up to the curb. The lights in the office were off. She paced up to the doors, locked. She peered inside. The desk was there, but cleared off. The plants were gone. So was the picture. She pounded on the glass. Anyone there? She rattled the door. Let me in! A dog barked in the distance. Tasha's pulse pounded in her temple, and her arms and legs started to shake. They had her entire savings. She paced back towards the car. Call the police. But what if there was a reasonable explanation? Maybe there really was more than one Andrew Baker at Harvard. She trotted back up to the door, picked up a rock, and shattered the glass. She thrust her fist inside and unlocked the door. The desk was empty. She pushed through the warehouse doors. The glass pods were there, but the computer was gone. Empty dry ice containers sat behind the aquariums, with tubes that extended underneath. She opened the door to the pod where the baseball had disappeared. The bottom looked like cheap grade plastic. She pushed it and it descended and then popped up again, spring-loaded. A baseball rolled around underneath, partially hidden. She fished it out. Andrew's signature was on it. She staggered up, clutching her stomach and trying to keep from vomiting. She had been conned by less than $500 worth of equipment that you could get at any hardware store. Wishful thinking had clouded her judgment. It was Stanford all over. She stumbled out to her car, grabbed her cell phone, and started to dial 911. The swindlers couldn't have gotten far. She stopped dialing. Her finger nudged up against the last button. Even if she recovered the money, the humiliation would be almost unbearable. The story would be leaked to the media. They'd remember her. Oh, yes. The jackals never forgot. The teleportation fanatic fooled again. But it wasn't just that. Another scandal would further diminish the credibility of a field that was already close to joke status. It would be another excuse for bright minds to expend their mental energy elsewhere. She couldn't contribute to that. She'd done enough damage. No police, she decided, hanging up. It was only money and pride that she had lost, both expendable. But then there was Byron. Despite their issues, she still loved him. She sped home, her fingernails cutting crescent moons into the steering wheel. Byron's stuff was packed. Two suitcases sat in the hall. The walls were cleaned of his football posters, the shelves empty of the fantasy pewter figurines he collected. He shuffled down the stairs, a duffel bag slung over one shoulder. He glanced up, noticing her. Oh, it's you. What are you doing? What does it look like, Einstein? I have to tell you something. The bank called. He said. Apparently you left in a hurry before they could give you copies of the paperwork for the loan you took out. Then I called the broker. Guess what she told me? I'm sorry. I warned you, Tasha. A guy can only put up with so much. He said, nudging into the hall and grabbing the suitcases. But you'll be happy to know your teleportation theory finally worked. I'm teleporting myself away from you. Where will you go? An old high school friend said I could live with him while I go back to college. Byron, we can work this out. I'm tired of just scraping by, Tasha. And I've always wanted to complete my degree. I, I just didn't have the will before. He paused as if wanting to say something else, then pursed his lips. Goodbye. She stood aside as he hustled out of the door. A moment later, she heard the trunk slam and the tires squealing as he backed out of the driveway. He wouldn't be back, she knew, but maybe he'd be happier. 
A fruit basket hung from the ceiling in the kitchen, and Tasha grabbed an apple, chomping into it. She then strolled upstairs to her study and threw open a window. Fresh air flooded the room like spring water, invigorating her. She sat at her desk, pen in hand, and remembered Andrew's rhetoric. We are all made up of subatomic particles, he had said. If one can be teleported, why not a group of them? And subatomic particles could be teleported. Scientists have been doing that in the lab for years. In the con man spiel, bullshit to be sure, he had unwittingly given her an idea for a new direction, a new theory. She hunched over and started to write, the ideas coming almost faster than she could put them on paper. She scribbled until her fingers cramped, then switched hands, working all night and well into the next day. She'd never been so motivated, not in years. Author's note, I got the idea for this story while watching a rerun on cable of the 1986 version of The Fly, starring Jeff Goldblum. In the beginning of the movie, Goldblum's character tries to seduce Gina Davis's character by showing her his teleportation machines. She thought it was an elaborate ploy to get into her panties, and her boss, the magazine editor, thought it was a fraud as well. Of course, it turned out not to be a fraud but it got me thinking about how difficult it might be to convince someone a fake teleportation machine was real. Perhaps an educated individual, but also a bit of a shut-in. Someone who is passionate about the possibility of teleportation, and under the right circumstances, willing to suspend disbelief for a little while. This is how Tasha Meckler's character was born. And even though she got conned, I wanted to end on an up note leaving open the possibility of her future success in the field. And I do think she will be successful. I hope folks enjoyed this story, and I thank you for your time. Okay, welcome back. I hope you guys enjoyed the story. I say guys loosely. I'm sure there's probably only one guy. But we hope that you, sir, enjoyed the story. There might be many girls, though. No, that's not like Well, no, a, a woman read the story. Oh, true. I'm sure she will listen. That'll probably give us two listeners. And you know what? I'm going to listen to this story. So there. Yeah, but you know, We count. got three. You can't be a listener and a host. I guess that's true, but... But 080 ots going to listen to the story, too. Will that give us four? Hey, look, if I don't count, he sure as hell does not count. Well, I'm not listening. No way. Had enough. Oh, you know, that actually reminds me. Uh, I don't know if now is the perfect time to mention this, but I'm going to. Go ahead. Well, basically, I just wanted to apologize about the low quality of the last couple episodes. I, I, I just got real tired. I started to not care. Uh, I left in stuff that probably should have been cut out. I might have cut stuff out that was important to leave in so you could hear what we were talking about. There was probably hiss throughout the darn thing. <sighs> I'm going to try and do better. We're at the beginning of a new issue. Yes. This is the what? S- spring issue. Spring, yeah. And I'm, I'm, I'm rejuvenated. But I apologize. And I, I always worry. Like uh, oh, Jason Sanford's episode last week, I, I worried that he'd think, that this is what they have to offer every week? I'm never giving them a story again. In fact, <laughs> I'm going to ask them to take my story off. <laughs> But I'm going to try harder this issue, and I hope that uh, you find our, our discussions much more scintillating. No one has ever found our discussions uh, Yeah, scintillating. that's not going to happen. But yeah, let's, uh, Hopefully I, you can listen all the way through, though. With that bringing up an interesting point, we wanted to ask maybe like an informal poll and see if anybody wants to comment and just say whether they listen all the way through the episodes very often, or do they just always, you know, as soon as the story's over, they're like, okay, skip on to the next podcast. Or what exactly they do. Of course, the problem with that is if you don't listen all the way through, you probably have already skipped on to the next podcast. So I don't know if that's going to work. But uh, Yeah, I try to put a lot of work into what we usually call this the intro, even though the story is <laughs> over. But if nobody's that's, listening... That's just because I hate the word outro because it's not a real word, even though people use it. All right. But that's why we call it an intro. It's all my fault. Sorry. Well, I just thought that we'd probably get a lot more episodes done... If we did away with these extras altogether, (laughs) 
Uh, Extra was this horror film from the 80s about an alien that took over the form of this kid's dad. Yeah. I, I really enjoy doing the uh, the post-story discussion. As I mentioned, that's kind of why I wanted to get into this podcasting thing. But if people don't like it, if if, if, if it's irritating, if it's tiresome, then maybe we'll, we'll cut way back on it. But I, I don't know. And, and that actually reminds me of another question that I will get to in a few minutes. Let's, let's yeah, talk about this. Now's not the time. You don't even know what my question <laughs> is. I just want to sound smart. Okay, and I want to have you make a new issue resolution to not say that's right in this episode. Just because... I'll try. In the last episode, if you said that's right less than 10 times... You said it at least 20 times, and I hacked mm. and slashed. But there were some that just had to stay in. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, it's just one of those weird habits. I only say it when we do the podcast, but I do it all the time. When I first got married to my wife, I would talk with my mother-in-law on the phone, and, and she would say, she's Canadian, and she would say this phrase, and I, I couldn't even figure out what she was saying. You'd say like, oh, yeah, so we went shopping, and we found what we were looking for. She'd say, oh, you found what you were looking for on a day. And I would be like... On a day? That's what I thought she said too. But it wasn't it. It's on it A? <laughs> on it A was what she would say. Is and that like when somebody says F and A? I had to have my wife explain it to me. What is on it A? What does that mean? A, obviously, people... She's Canadian. So she says A, and that's just what you have to say after you say something in Canada. It's, uh, it's like a period or something. And She would say on it A, and on it is like, oh, yeah, you're on it. You know, it's like... Good on you. Yeah, like good on you or something Which is if you also, were British. Do you say good on you? No, I don't. Okay, I don't either. And she still, 10 years later... Is Canadian? I, is what Canadian. a horrible woman. How do you put up... <laughs> And still says on it a all the time. You know, in, if she was to say a paragraph, you know, we'll say there's four sentences that she said, at least two of them would end with on it a. Good thing my mother-in-law doesn't listen to this podcast. Cause or anyone else. Yeah, she might get irritated. My wife doesn't even listen to this. She's just like, oh, your show? No, I didn't listen to that. Did listen to Escape Pod, Pseudopod, Podcastle. Watch Living Lohan. <laughs> So it's weird how you just, you get some kind of phrase that you say all the time and it just gets stuck in your head and you say it a lot. It's part of the big Anklovich persona on oh, the air, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I made it up just for that. Yeah, I'm, I'm putting on my on-air personality when I say, that's right. Oh, wait, but I'm not supposed to say that. You said it just a second ago. Do you realize that you said it? When I said it's part of oh. your big Anklovich persona. But that at least fit with the conversation, right? It may, but you say it a lot. <laughs> Anyway, I'm sure there are things that I say or words that I mispronounce, like Montebank, that you can't irritate use that. Some Nobody's people. gonna understand what the freak you're talking about. Good on them. <laughs> so a better teleportation theory. Yes. Sorry, I'm gonna, I'm just gonna be honest. I have no idea how long ago this this guy sent <laughs> us this story. I remember reading the title months and months and months ago, and then it just yeah. it went out of my mind, and I guess I thought that we had rejected it or something because here it is mid 2009 and now this story comes up again it was at the latest submitted in october probably more like august so michael anthony right bass player for van halen really yes wow this guy is multi -ta is is it's funny is that van halen not together anymore well not really they're together in some form but Michael Anthony is not the bassist anymore. Well, but he's writing fiction. And to yeah. me, that's really important. It's funny that he didn't mention that in his, his intro, don't you think? Well, it was probably an omission by whoever read that. In oh, that was me. So what was the problem? Or was there no problem at all? Well, I think the main... I mean, people will probably recall, especially longtime listener, he will recall that uh, we put out a call for volunteers for female readers. Because early on in the podcast, I thought, there's a lot of stories that have female main characters, such as this one. And boy, it would sure be a lot better if we had a female read these than Rish Outfield putting on his girl voice. While he does a good girl voice because he's quite girly, he, you know, is not as good as a genuine girl. He, he hasn't taken that step yet. So. I'm, I'm saving that. So, uh, yeah, we, we managed to coerce some people into reading for us. And so six or eight or ten months down the line, we finally got Michael Anthony's story on. And I'm happy that we finally have made it to that point. When we first started off, we had no stories, obviously. And then they would trickle in. We had, oh, here's a good story. Oh, we got another good story. And pretty soon, we had a queue 
as they say in Britain, of people. I say it too. Whose stories have been accepted. But there, yeah, and there are a couple other stories that sort of fit in that category. It's just due to the complications of getting other people to send voices in. And sometimes somebody will miss a line yeah. or we forgot to send them a line. So we have to postpone that episode another week or just skip it all together and come back to it in a month or whatever. And these are things that we can't really avoid. It's one of those things that comes from having multiple readers. And in just reading the comments from a couple weeks back, the people that were commenting like the multiple readers. They like having a female doing a female voice. So we're going to try and continue that. We'll try and be more efficient. Uh, again, Michael, I'm sorry, Mr. Anthony, uh, I apologize if it took too long. And we will try our best if you send uh, another story to us to get on it faster. If you have a story that you think we must have on our podcast, feel free to please send it our way. How would they get that to us? Send it in the body of an email to submissions at doonstief.com. Read through those submission guidelines, send it on over to us, and we will make sure it is read. If it passes muster, it will be on this podcast. Going back to the whole apologizing to Jason Sanford, going back to apologizing to Michael Anthony. I, I want to apologize to those people that were like in our first couple of episodes because <laughs> the the sound quality was so bad. And yeah, I've become really paranoid about that <laughs> because there were a couple of voices where you could hear a humming and stuff in just the last couple. One of those guys that was one of the three or four first uh, submitters never sent us another story. And I, I hope that it was because uh, he, he, he took his life or he was involved in some kind of accident and he could never write again. And not because he just hated the production quality of our story or the way that we read it or that hiss that was in the background. We're really trying to make the sound quality better. Uh, somebody gave us a suggestion of how you can equalize the levels a little better, and we're going to implement that on our next story. And This is a, a bit of advice for, for folks who do submit stories to us. That's right. Oh, so I don't want to say that's right. Yeah, and maybe to help the sound quality improve, you know, you could toss a donation this way. I don't know. I mean, we are still holding the mics, so if you don't like hearing that all the time, because I know that it does happen a lot, you know, we'd love to buy stands for these mics. It's funny what we went on Amazon.com to see how much stands were, and we're like, you know, we can almost afford those. And then somebody sent us a story. Yeah. That's... So we, yes, we pay our authors. We pay them with that money that you donate. Our authors and their love for money. <laughs> They're all just out to get rich. You can tell. Then why would they come to the Dunes? Oh, you're right. They just do it out of the love of their hearts. There is a donation button right there on the website. You can press the button, send us a donation through PayPal. I press the button. You get to say those great five words and uh, help us out. And we do appreciate it. And nobody's donated in the last week or so, have they? Funny you should mention that. No, no, no. I didn't mention it. And there so, was R-O-T, a donation. As a matter of fact, about, the are donations there any hate letters this week? poured in almost to the point where we could buy stands. So if you got any more stories like this one that you're about to tell, You know, it's not a great story. make it's sure just, to mention it. It's, it's something that I'm somewhat embarrassed about because of... <laughs> Let's when I, hear it. <clears throat> <laughs> there are different tiers of work in the entertainment industry. And you may hear that PA is the lowest tier. It is not. And you may hear that extra is the lowest. There is a notch below extra. Yeesh. And it is known as audience member. <laughs> and when I first moved to L.A., I did audience work, which is you just sit in the audience of a talk show, filling seats. If it's a bad talk show and they can't get actual people who want to see the show, they pay people to just sit there and clap. And one of those shows was Richard Simmons' very short-lived Dream Maker. And basically, Richard Simmons had a talk show, a daytime talk show, where he would bring somebody on the show and make their dream come true in were... his specifically Richard Simmons-esque way. <laughs> Tell me about it, O T. Wait, what? What did he say? Nothing. Go on. Uh, um, okay. So so I had to sit in the audience and clap and, and cheer and you do it for $5 an hour or some crap. They, but they pay in cash 
So it's something that people with no other place to go sometimes do. Uh huh. So I, I believe I did it two days. On the first day, I two sat, days of Richard Simmons' Dream Maker. You must have been really desperate in those days. So the first day, I sat there and you know I was bored and hid a book under my leg or whatever. And when they weren't shooting, I would read. And, you know, we'd all make fun of Richard Simmons because he came out in his little <laughs> short shorts and his tank top and he'd come in and he's like, oh, welcome to Dream Maker. So we, we mocked him and who hasn't mocked Richard Simmons in their life? But it's Richard Simmons has never mocked himself. I think he's as he's in on the at... joke as anybody else. <laughs> you think so? Basically, he would bring out the guest for each episode and they had something unfortunate about them. Uh, they, they were obese. They were ill. They were in a wheelchair. There was something. And they had called the number or gone to the website or, or however found out about this show mm -hmm. and said, but this is my dream. And Richard Simmons would do what he could to make that happen. We would watch the video of that and then they would talk about it and they would thank Richard for what he had done. The first row, the front row was for VIPs like the family members of this person who was the guest. Mm -hmm. But of course, that was like four seats out of 20. And so they said, if any of you would like to be on the first row, any of you who are the most exuberant, who are the most <laughs> delighted to be here, who love Richard the most, you can sit on this front row <laughs> with the VIPs. But who would want to do this? Because I mean, to see him in person, he, I mean, he is an odd looking dude and, and they'd grease him up and he was made up, you know, had makeup on and his, his hair and they'd spray it and all that. So it looked oh, like he'd just been recently jerry curled. But at the end of this first day, they had this little girl and she wore glasses and she was like 12, but she was already 200 pounds and she was in a wheelchair. And it was like her dream to go to Disneyland and meet Mickey and Minnie and all that stuff. And Richard had made this happen. And we watched the video and I saw the delight on this fat, unattractive little girl. And in the moment where she was just overcome with joy, she was beautiful. Hmm. And then she came out and she's like, thank you, Richard. And you could tell by the way she was talking, there was something developmentally wrong with her. And I just started bawling when she was like, thank you, Richard. And he came and he's like, oh, sweetie, anything to see that smile on your face. Anyway, it was the end of the show and he'd go out and, and hug the people on the front row and thank them for coming on Dream Maker. And if you have a dream, I'm your dream maker <laughs> kind of thing. And we would all clap and thankfully they'd say cut and we could go back to our normal lives. But uh, they said, okay, anybody who wants to do Dream Maker tomorrow, you know, we'll pay you $20 to spend eight hours sitting here. <laughs> and I signed up. I was like, sure. And uh, I read like three books a week in those days because you'd just be sitting all the time. And the next day I showed up and where did I sit? <laughs> I sat my not yet flabby arse right there on the front row in the VIP section. You weren't told to sit on this front row. You did this out of love for that girl from the day before. Out of love for that girl and out of love for Richard Simmons. Because <laughs> I got to see this guy even when the cameras were off. And he believed 100% that this was the greatest show that anyone had ever done. And who gives a crap about the ratings and all that? Uh, just to make one person happy, he was willing to do this stuff. And I, I was just like, wow, this guy puts up with so much crap. And it was just hilarious to mock this guy. But I, was, I, I, I gained this, this tremendous respect for him. And I, I, you're laughing, but it's like, yeah, of course. I raised my hand. I'll be on that front row. And Richard came out and we did the shows or whatever. And he's like, I'm the dream maker. And the people would jump up and he would come running to hug the people. And yeah, like I said, he was all greased up like a pig oh. at a rodeo. And I hugged him. So I hugged him more than once that second <laughs> You guys day. did like five episodes that day or something, didn't you? I think we would probably do three and it took about eight hours. So uh, like a, a couple weeks later, I saw him on David Letterman and Letterman said, I understand, Richard, that you had a show on TV called The Dream Maker. And Richard says, I don't want to talk about it. And he's like, no, 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 come on. The audience wants to know. And the audience cheered. And I was like, oh, hey, he's going to talk about that show I did. And I guess they aired like three episodes or for the first week, five episodes, and they canceled it. <laughs> it was canceled. And 
it was weird because you could he really did have his feelings hurt and I, sometimes it's hard to read whether he's really mad at Dave or whether Dave really hates him as much as he pretends to and all that stuff but yeah in that one you could tell that it had really bummed Richard Simmons out and I felt for him instead of feeling for David Letterman for the first time yeah I never saw Richard Simmons again I don't know if anybody ever saw this Dreammaker show to be honest but uh I kind of like him now. And, you know, there are you know, people... I never knew how much you loved Richard Simmons. That's interesting. All these years and... I'm not saying I would take a bullet for Richard Simmons, but, but I would... take like a boomerang. If somebody threw a boomerang at him, you'd jump in front of that, right? You know what? I would take a bullet for Richard Simmons. Let's just move on. All right. And you, you were all acting embarrassed... Uh, you said you were going to tell your story of how you hugged Richard Simmons. You said, no, no, no. But it turns out you're just hoping for the chance. You're like, I love Richard Simmons. He's the greatest. You own all of his Sweat into the Oldies tapes now, don't you? On mini disc. Oh, I'm sorry. I come from a future where Richard Simmons is on the $3 bill. <laughs> So speaking of the future that you come from, where they have a $3 bill, and Richard Simmons is on it. Sir Richard Simmons. <laughs> wearing the red and white striped. Are they boxer shorts? They look like boxer shorts. I, you I who hugged him and rubbed up against around. those shorts. They were so silky smooth. Oh. His legs, I mean, not the... <laughs> not the shorts. Uh, yeah. Okay. So anyway, speaking of the future, we, we have a story today that's about teleportation. Uh, it's one of those things. We we were speaking a little earlier today about that. We were talking about concepts. Things that you see a lot in science fiction. Time travel, teleportation, faster than light travel. But there's people that, you know, go into hyperspace and they warp across the galaxy to some other planet. And they make star travel seem as simple as, you know, getting on an airplane and going to Hackensack or something. There's lots of concepts like that where, you know, scientists for the most part, discount those things as, as impossible. There's a lot of things that it's, it, it's more fun in a story to be able to have those things, teleportation. In this story, it doesn't seem like he discounts it as impossible. And it's like he said in his author's note, you know, he likes to to leave it open to to make people think that, you know, maybe she really will accomplish her goal. Well, you know, it's really possible that your grandchildren, great grandchildren or whatever, will look at videos of people attempting teleportation the way that we look at those early, early films of people with planes that they've built <laughs> and it's part of a bicycle or it's part of their arms and things like that, right. where it's just like, oh, <laughs> silly black and white people. <laughs> It's because I, I don't know anything about particle physics or right. the mechanisms that would need to be possible for teleportation to exist. But Michael made it very plausible to me in the story that, you know, they just need to work the kinks out and uh, and, and they'll have it. Yeah. How far in the future was this story supposed to take place? I think it was supposed to be just today, tomorrow maybe. The future, the future is where you and I, I will spend, spend the rest, the rest of, of our lives. lives. Okay, so tr Star Trek has the transporter, mm -hmm. um, and every once in a while they would do a transporter accident. I mean, did you ever watch Star Trek? I didn't watch that much of it. Like, there's there, there's the famous one where Kirk is transported to a parallel universe where the Federation is evil. That one is probably the second or third most famous Star Trek episode. And there was one where, the, due to a transporter accident, Kirk is split into a good half and an evil half. There was one where. Riker, due to a transporter accident, is split. He's copied. And one copy goes aboard his ship, and the other one stays on the planet, and then the ship just takes off and leaves him there. And this poor guy has been on this planet by himself, trying to send a message. Hey, I'm still here for four or five years. And, you know, he's grown a beard, and, and, and he's tried to keep himself sane. It was a really, really good yeah, episode. But some people talk about that as a bad one. But, strangely, the example I remember most is from the worst of the Star Trek films, the motion picture. The very first movie, there's this transporter accident where they lose the signal and it, it bounces back or something, just breaks up and they beam the person back and, and the, he doesn't rematerialize right. And we don't see what ends up on the transporter pad, but you see everybody's like horrified expression. And but they said, did you get the science officer? Did you get him? And they said, what we beamed back didn't live for very long. 
And so you're just like, oh my gosh, what was it? And as kids, we would talk about that all the time. It like turned this guy inside out or whatever it might have happened. <laughs> no, like it, a tribble came aboard is what it was. <laughs> and they had to step on it before it multiplied. And of course, that reminds me of the fly, the David Cronenberg one, where they don't beam. What did they call that? They transport a baboon from one to the other and something comes out wrong. And I believe it turned inside out. The, the fly is a really cool flick. I always think of the uh, Simpsons Treehouse of Horrors episode where they did the fly where uh, Homer somehow gets a transporter, a teleporter, whatever you want to call it. And he's got it set up so that he can sit on the couch, but he's actually sitting on the toilet so he never has to get up to go to the bathroom. Homer! And he's watching the TV at the same time. And I think he's got the other end of it also like right next to the fridge so he can just reach over, get a beer out or whatever. You remember the kids put the dog and the cat in? And it comes out with the head of the cat on one end and the head of the dog on the other. And Bart says, you know, all of the fun, none of the mess. <laughs> and then the other end comes. <laughs> and it's two butts. <laughs> but yeah, Bart, of course, eventually becomes part fly. The Fly is a really, really good movie. But what's more, the 1958 Fly was really, really good. And, you know, I tend to dismiss the 50s science fiction and horror movies as being really lame. But holy cow, that was a good movie. A lot of them were just meant for uh, something to be on while people were doing other things at the drive-in. Oh, hey, I hadn't thought of that. It's kind of like the Sci-Fi Channel originals. Of <laughs> right. Man, those movies are bad. You did watch Star Trek? You never watched it? I think I've seen all of the movies at least once. But the old show you The know, show I saw an episode here or there. I didn't really see that. I did see a whole lot of Next Generation. On the original series, Dr. McCoy was always afraid to use the transporter. And he would say, you know, I don't want my atoms beamed all over space kind of thing. Uh -huh. And the technology had been around long enough in, I think it was the 23rd century, that everyone were like, oh, <laughs> you old fashioned, you dumb bastard. <laughs> okay, so let's say they came up with a teleporter and it would transport you a thousand miles uh -huh. in the blink of an eye. Would you dare use it? They say 999 times out of a thousand, the person comes out perfectly fine. There is the Brundle fly exception, but... I would want the odds to be a little higher than a thousand to one, I think. They say it's safer than automobile travel by far. Although everything is safer than automobile travel. <laughs> Being shot out of a cannon is safer <laughs> than automobile travel. More people survive uh, their trip as a human cannonball. It's much safer than automobile travel. Almost as safe as flying in a plane. I, I don't know. I mean, that's... They say sign this form first, Mr. Anklevich. <laughs> You're feeling fine. No dizziness. No agoraphobia. You're done having children, right? That has to be ink. Would... I'm sorry. What was that part about not having children? Nothing. Nothing. Never mind. Never mind. Just sign. <laughs> I don't know. I, I mean, I'm assuming most likely before it got around to someone like me being able to use it, they would have worked out an awful lot of the kinks and the odds would probably be better than a thousand to one. So I probably would because can you imagine like the things that I think of, you know, I, I actually wrote a story like this, which will probably never see the light of day. So maybe I'll... Uh, Shoot, I'd forgotten. I'm sorry, man. We should have been talking about your story. Well, we are. It was a little different because in my story, they weren't teleported. They they had a door that opened into hyperspace and they stepped through hyperspace to wherever else they were going. So it was like warp. a wormhole. Yeah, it was. It would make like a little mini wormhole, basically. It was like warping, you know. They got on the Millennium Falcon. Punch it, Chewy. They went, yeah, they went right through hyperspace to Alderaan. Except for instead of going to Alderaan, it was it was a much more simple thing. It was like they got in the phone booth and they dialed the house that they wanted to go to and they went to it. Instead of just their voice going to it was kind of the idea. I just thought, gosh, the things that you could do, you know, you, if you had something like teleportation, would people need cars at all? Like everybody has a phone, if everybody had a uh, door that you could step through hyperspace to wherever, would there be roads? Oh, so it wasn't, there's a community teleporter and everybody right. uses it. Was, it. There's a personal teleporter. It was the dream of the person who had invented this thing. Of course, it never occurred because everything ends badly in my stories. I mean, I have a crappy, endless, long drive to work. And that's one of the reasons why I do a podcast is because I listen to so many podcasts on my drive to work that I just thought, hey, maybe I can do that. So yeah, I have like an hour of drive to work and I hate it. And I just thought, gosh, can you imagine being able to just go to the door, dial the number for home, step through to your house and just do that in an instant? How amazing that would be. And how much would that change the world? 
there'd be no need for cars anymore except for maybe if you're going to some remote location you're going up into the woods that where they don't necessarily have warp gate set up <laughs> for you to warp through alas it was only a story one of the best stories i've ever read was called the jaunt by stephen king it's in skeleton crew his collection and it takes place in the future and everybody uses this teleportation technology called the jaunt to get wherever they want to go they were they've colonized other worlds using this jaunt technology uh -huh. room, you know and this man takes his family to jaunt for the first time and he tells them the history of the jaunt while they're preparing to go you know it's kind of like taxiing on the runway uh-huh he, I, I, I mean, I have no idea. I've never met Mr. King, but I would love to talk to him how, how he got the idea for this. And he came up with every possible ramification of like the mob using the jaunt to dispose of bodies and urban legends arise of people who jaunt and no, don't materialize and they're just floating around out there someplace. And of course, because it's King, it has a, an ending even worse than yours. Oh, <laughs> I, I, I could not recommend that story more. King hasn't written a lot of science fiction, but wow, I just really love that it felt completely believable and thought out, and he really gave a damn back in those days. <laughs> <laughs> it is one of those things about teleportation. I mean, it's always easy to imagine the worst. You know, what came out the other side didn't live very long. But imagine if it did exist, and yeah, the the whole oil yeah, shortage you thing would end. You would need oil. Food. Who needs a car? Everybody on the earth would be able to be fed. That's right. Because sorry, I'm not going to say that again. That's true. If you could get things to Africa as easily as you could call Africa, you just dial the number and you walk through. I mean, I, I guess I wonder, would it be a good thing for everybody? Because, I mean, how many people make their living transporting things from one place to another? How many people make their living supplying cars and trucks and planes and boats and everything with fuel, etc.? And so how many people would be wanting to stop this uh, teleportation becoming possible? So if there was a Tasha Meckler, like in the story... And she developed this. You think like the oil companies or the big corporations would squelch it and hide it away and it would be in that big warehouse with the ark. And <laughs> I, I'm the, sure they'd probably try. I wonder how many good inventions you think there are that have just been crushed by people who were afraid to lose their livelihood. I'll bet you that somewhere on this planet right now, there is an automobile that runs on urine. <laughs> And you wake up in the morning, and you, you pee, whiz and that's pipe. enough to drive a hundred miles. <laughs> and it is hidden away. We'll never see this thing. I mean, you don't have to use urine, but urine is really you potent. You don't have to use yeah. urine. You could crap in it. <laughs> that would run it for 200 miles. It's just real hard there. to get it into the gas tank. <laughs> I'm sure that, there, I mean, we always hear horror stories about the electric car and solar powered bosom enhancements and things like that, that just get covered up because there's so much money to be made in the way things are done right yeah. now. Yeah. People have their way of doing business and there's a lot of, I mean, you look at what is happening to record companies right now, since people are able to just share files, they're falling apart and they don't know what to do and they weren't ready to deal with it. And so they're falling apart and I'm sure they wish they could have squelched that new technology of peer-to-peer -peer sharing before it ever got a toehold. I've heard enough about hybrid cars and even more so the fuel cell cars that should have been ready for people to use years and years ago. But, you know, oil companies are in there demanding and paying lots of money to uh, car makers to keep them from really getting too into developing these technologies because they want things to stay the way they are. But can you imagine if there was teleportation, how much it would change every facet of your day? you want to go to the store, you dial the store number and you step through to the store. I what don't know. What if two people dialed the same number at the same time and they merged together? There would be simple ways to make sure that that doesn't happen. I and mean, obviously it wasn't just like you dial the number, you step through because if you dial the wrong number, for example, and you step through into the wrong house, that would be trouble. So obviously you dial the number and then the house would have to say accept or decline or whatever. So there'd, there'd be either a computer or a person that would be there, you know, monitoring this stuff. 
Okay, so you, you get a big box of grenades and you just dial numbers at random. <laughs> and awesome. when the portal opens, you just toss one through and then dial a new number. If people accepted the call, they could possibly be blown. And the postal service, for example, there wouldn't need to be a postal service. You just put letters. You could put packages in a box or, I mean, they're in a box, I guess, already. You just put the package there, dial the number, send it off. Well, there would be competing teleportation companies. Use Verizon teleportation. <laughs> we get you there 0. 0.0065 seconds faster than our nearest competition. Plus only 35 cent support. Unlimited yeah. nights and weekends. Plus only one in a million people have been disintegrated in their teleports. You might come through without a butt, but who needs it really? All the fun, none of the mess. You know, there are a lot of ideas. I've never written a teleportation story, really, although I, I have written time travel stories. Do you think Spe everybody has one? In them? I don't know. Speaking of? speaking of time travel, we both wrote a time travel story as a broken mirror. Yeah, I was just thinking about that the other day. And the broken mirror story event has, has begun. begun. That's right. It is. Shoot, I said that's right again. It is April now. And I hope people are, are excited about this. Did you want to tell them what the Broken Mirror event is about? Yeah, let's bring it back up. The Broken Mirror Story event is a event that Rish and I have been doing it for quite some time. Always um, safely, folks. We basically would just come up with a premise and we say, okay, here's the premise. Now write your story that goes along with this, this idea. And so we would go off, we write our own stories, and then we'd get together and we'd swap stories and we'd read it and we'd see the differences from one story to the other. And it was always a really interesting thing to see, you know, the differences that, that there are and the similarities that there are in, in the stories. I mean, we'd start with the same idea and then we would go usually in completely different directions. I think with the time travel one, we started out with the ending. Here's your time travel story and this happens in the end. And yet your story and my story could not have been more different. <laughs> That's true. I mean, I, mine was all about magic and, and, and I tried to be funny. And yours, of course, was really tragic and unpleasant. <laughs> and yours was just as tragic. Was the there, ending was the same. Was there magic in yours? No, mine was all scientific. Okay. I tried to make time travel seem real. And so for the month of April, we've got our broken mirror event. Basically, anyone who wants to participate can send us a story at submissions at dunesteef.com. In the case of this story, be sure to mark it as a broken mirror event story so we'll know and uh, we'll put it in with the other stories and we can read them all together. The premise for this month's event, someone arrives in town and discovers that everyone there is exactly the same. You can take that wherever you want to go with it. Whatever sick and twisted path your mind traverses, follow that path and write us a story. You have until April 30th. Send it in. And uh, I know it's some work, it but Big work. and I are both going to try and do it, uh, right? Did, we, yes, did we, we promise to do it on the show or are we going? should we do that right now? Well, I promise. I, I don't know if I can, man. I wrote two stories in March and I... Promise. Now. Okay. Okay. So we both promise we will put in our own stories. And then we'll send them off incognito to our readers. And we'll see if ours even make the cut or if everybody else is better than ours. I mean, who knows? We've tried to be kind of vague in how we'll do this. But if anybody has a question about how it should be done or rules, if something that occurs to you that hasn't occurred to us, send us that question to editor at dunesteef.com. We'll try and address it on the air or we'll put it on the, the submission guidelines. Yeah. Uh, just because we've not done this before except for when it's been him and me. And I'm sure there have been times that we've just sent an email and said, hey, can I, can I use the C word in this story? You're like, no. <laughs> you keep sending me those emails. and What is the deal with you and the C word? I like it. I so anyways, folks, yeah, we, we invite everybody to participate because it's going to be a whole lot more fun if everybody participates than if just Rish and I write a story. So coming up in this summer, we'll be doing uh, episodes with the best of these stories. I look forward to reading them, and I hope that you all look forward to hearing them down the line. Okay, so that'll be next issue, right? Yeah, it won't be until summer issue. This sure. issue, we've got a bunch of stories lined up. I'm really excited about some of these that uh, we've already started recording, and uh, we've got something special coming up for you, probably not in this month, but the next one, that's uh, something we've not done before. All right, so that's our show. Thanks for listening this long. 
This has been Rish Outfield. And Big Anklevich. Don't be afraid. No, be afraid. Be very afraid. Good night. See ya. Thank you for listening to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. The Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine is published under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. This means that you may share these files with anyone, but you may not charge for them or alter them. Take two. Anyhow, I, I saw Richard Simmons a couple days later on Letterman. Oh, I thought you were going to say when he came over and we played cards. It wasn't cards. We played Twister. Oh, and, and it was easy because he was all greased up. So it wasn't so hard. to. No, not. no, it was hard to stay on top of him. <laughs> <Gosh>. <laughs> 080T. I know I've said bad things to you in the past. Please cut that out.